Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Munib, co-founder of Blockstack, and today I'm going to talk about the end of cloud computing. So there's this pendulum swing that we notice in computing. We used to have mainframes, these big machines, and then we got desktops. Everyone got their own computer where they can have their own data and run their own programs locally. And then we started seeing this shift back to a cloud, which is really mainframes again. We became these dumb terminals where all of our data and all of the computations were actually running somewhere else. And other companies actually owned all of that infrastructure. But now we are seeing this trend back to decentralized computing. That's the excitement that you see uh, in, the, in the blockchain industry. Right now, we don't exactly know what is decentralized computing. So today, we are going to try and define that term. Uh, and basically, you would notice that right now, we don't even have a common terminology where different projects can even talk to each other about. Everyone seems to have their own lens to look at this world, and, and that's fine, right? So some of the things that uh, we have noticed is that, in general, we can look at what's happening at, with the broad term of networked computing, right? So just think of this as like, just go back to first principles, forget what you know, think of this as it's just a bunch of devices who are talking to each other over some network, right? So that's networked computing. And now we will try to see historically how that played out. So one version is that in the 90s, we got the internet. These, these devices started talking to each other. And in 2000s, we started getting huge companies like Google and Facebook that started collecting all this data and started building these clouds, right? And now we are seeing a decentralized internet. That's a term that has been going around in different projects. Uh, another way to look at this is Web 1.0, Web 2.0, which was more interactive. People could actually post things as well, and, and apps became more interactive. And again, the data was being stored by the companies. And now we are looking at Web 3.0 that is more decentralized. Some people like to use the term the World Wide Web. And the biggest change that they noticed was the mobile web. And now they're calling it the decentralized web. I actually prefer the last version, where we had personal computers then got cloud computing, and now we are moving toward decentralized computing. But don't let these terms confuse you. These are basically all the same thing, right? My lens of the world comes from there, and that's because of my background. I did a PhD in computer science, mostly focusing on cloud computing, and, and over the last five years working with Blockstack, what we are trying to enable is decentralized computing. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about how we can go from cloud computing to decentralized computing. So as I said, all of these terms, they roughly mean the same thing. I just have a slight reference for the term decentralized computing. So now we're going to look at how are these two different, and how are we moving from cloud computing to decentralized computing. At a very broad level, what happens with cloud computing is that you have these big companies in the middle, and they are sitting on all the user information, on all the data, they're pro providing free services to the users, but all the computation is running in the cloud, right? And this terminology is now famous enough that average users have some sort of understanding of what the cloud is, right? They know that my files are somewhere in the cloud uh, with some company. And with decentralized computing, that thing is getting replaced by open protocols, right? So these are actually much harder to build because now you're replacing the job that companies were doing who were actually managing these data centers and cloud infrastructure with open protocols, and you're giving people incentives to connect to this network, right? It's, it's definitely more challenging, but at the same time, more exciting and interesting as well. So looking at like, you know, a history of cloud computing, it really started with Google. Back then, we used to have supercomputers. Right? And what Google really said was that instead of building supercomputers for, for their search uh, requirements, what they're going to do is that they're actually going to take like, average uh, motherboards and just start racking them up. Right? And they started building servers like this. This is actually one of the first original Google servers at the Computer History Museum. So what they were doing is they were taking commodity hardware and just basically racking them up, and that evolved into these huge factories of computers, which are called data centers. 
That's where, whenever you are interacting with Google, whenever you're using, using Google Docs, for example, the programs are running in factories like these. All of your data is being stored in factories like these. And it wasn't just the technology, right? So this is Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon. And whenever I think of that era, this image comes to mind that Werner Vogels would just fly around the world, going everywhere, educating people about what the cloud is, educating developers about what the cloud is and why they should be building their apps uh, on the cloud. And, and they won. Right? Most developers these days actually use the cloud. Most of their apps are running in the cloud. And Amazon is a giant in this space now. So when looking at cloud computing versus decentralized computing, decentralized computing is something we don't really fully understand. So I, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to focus on three things. The first is scalability, how that plays out in these two different environments. The second is security, which is extremely important. And the third thing is the state of developer tools. So when you look at scalability, there is this poster child that Werner Vogels had uh, for promoting Amazon, this company called Animoto. What they did was they would actually like, take pictures and try to make interesting videos out of that. And they just blew up. In a single day, I think early 2008, they got 750,000 new users within three days. And the way the cloud computing infrastructure was designed, that they were actually able to absorb all of that load. And they were actually able to scale up. Before cloud computing, the same small startup would have to run around, try to buy their own hardware, try to actually install these servers, and, and basically scramble to scale to something like this, right? So they became a poster child of Amazon. And we have seen something similar in decentralized computing recently. CryptoKitties, they're actually in the audience here today. And we saw how CryptoKitties uh, took off on a decentralized computing platform called Ethereum. And, but there's a big difference. What happened with Animoto became a success story. It is still featured on the Amazon Web Services page. What happened with CryptoKitties led to headlines like these. And the reason is the, that the underlying infrastructure, we're still in very early days, is not there yet in terms of scalability. But that is changing. We have apps like Graphite, which is built on Blockstack. And just yesterday, they were on top of Hacker News. So this is built in a very different way. And I feel really excited to tell you that this app can actually take millions of users and still be able to work. So next, I'll look at security. Whenever we look at cloud computing, people don't even like, think about security that much. But there is a large body of researchers and engineers who actually do this for a living. Right? They, they, they try to figure out what are the different problems that all these different programs that are running in the cloud can run into, and what are different attacks. Just to give you an example, when you are, let's say, running uh, some sort of a VM in a cloud environment, there are other VMs running there as well. And there have been multiple attacks where one VM can actually steal data from the other VM running there. Right? And this starts sounding a little bit familiar when we are looking at security for decentralized systems as well. Right? Where we are now getting into what happens when you're trying to build decentralized apps and you're actually running this code on, on other people's machines? Or what happens when these smart contracts are interacting with each other? We are so early that basically people are making mistakes, just like in building smart contracts. We are not even at the level where we really start building models for security and how can we actually secure this model. So this is a very broad topic. And without getting too much into it, I'll just leave you with this thought that we are at an extremely early stage in terms of security, but you should pay a lot of attention to how these decentralized systems are designed because they can lead to very, very different properties. The next thing is developer tools. So Amazon Web Services didn't win cloud computing just because you could run VMs there. They have an entire set of protocols and subsystems that make lives of developers really easy. DynamoDB is one of them. 
You can store all of your data. They built access control and identity management services for developers, and so on and so forth. There are over 25 or 30 different services that Amazon actually provides to developers to meet their different needs. And the same thing is what we focus on with Blockstack. Right? We are building all those different tools that developers actually need to build their applications. One thing that I've noticed in this industry is that there's just too much emphasis on the blockchain itself and very little emphasis on all the different things you need outside of the blockchain. The blockchain is just a very small component of this. You actually need a lot of tooling. You actually need a lot of different systems, like, for example, storage systems that go with decentralized computing. So there already are a bunch of different options available to developers if they want to start building decentralized apps, Ethereum, Blockstack, and EOS being some of the major ones. But if you're a developer and you are thinking about building these apps, I think there are these three questions that you should ask yourself and try to get a better understanding of. The first is, can it actually scale to millions of users? Are you putting yourself at a disadvantage by building on a platform that cannot actually scale if your app becomes successful. The second question is, that is it secure? I mean, security is a very, very broad term, but one way to approach this is looking at the surface area of attack. There are certain systems that are designed in a way that have a very large attack surface, whereas there are other systems that are designed in a way where the possibility of attacks are very limited. And you need to understand these trade-offs when deciding which platform to build your app. And the third thing is developer tools. Do you have everything that you need to get started and basically get going with your app? And I think the platform that will actually end up winning, and there could be multiple of them, would basically have to nail all three things. So I just gave you a quick overview of what's happening in, in decentralized computing, but it's not just the computer science and the architectures that are getting built. There's an entire new wave of innovation. Basically, what happened in this era is that we got Microsoft and Apple and big companies like that. And then when cloud computing happened, again, there was a lot of innovation, and we saw companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And now there's this massive opportunity of rebuilding a lot of this digital infrastructure, and you're seeing really big projects emerge again. And it's not just the technology. Now there are other interesting aspects, like the crypto tokens that are usually attached with these decentralized protocols. First of all, they give people the right incentives to actually do protocol innovation again. The, the last decade or two were kind of depressing in a way, because if you're an engineer or, let's say, a, a, a computer scientist, you could only innovate if you're working for the big three companies. If you're not working for Google or Facebook, you didn't even have access to the kind of data or resources to be able to innovate at a protocol level. But now that has changed. Anyone in the world can now contribute to these open protocols, and they have the incentive to do so. These tokens are also introducing new types of funding models. And these models have changed with each era of computing. If you look at the desktop era, basically pre.com, you would have to go to VCs and basically raise millions of dollars even before you would launch your app, right? Because you would have to go buy the hardware, get all the software, and, and then start building whatever it is that you wanted to build. So cloud computing actually did everyone a huge favor by lowering the cost of starting an app or starting a startup. Now, now people started raising very small amounts of money, like seed rounds, and then experiment very quickly with what they're building. Again, when we are moving to decentralized computing, it is introducing new funding models as well, and, and these crypto tokens are a great example of that. In this world, it's actually easier for developers to innovate, because they get more access to more data, and they don't need to get permission from the Googles or the Facebooks of the world before they build their app. So I think that we would actually see a much faster rate of innovation. We would see much more apps very quickly emerging in this ecosystem. And we are all here building an open ecosystem and not 
walled gardens. What we are doing is actually good for the internet. It's actually good for humanity. I really believe that decentralized computing is the next evolution of computing. And I feel lucky to be alive in this time and to actually be able to contribute to what that future might look like. Thank you.